Young man, cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, let's have a few moments of silent prayer to make sure that uh, we're in fellowship. Give everybody the opportunity to use 1 John 1, 9 if necessary. Make sure we're ready to study the word, and then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful today that we can uh, come to you in prayer, and we can be thankful for answers to prayer, be thankful that um, the good news from uh, Jim Myers that it looks like he's going to be able to um, get a um, permanent visa, uh, resident visa for for Ukraine, and that they should be able to uh, get that accomplished before the middle of November. Father, we also pray for others in the congregation. Uh, such as Nancy Richards and her uh, discovery of pancreatic cancer. We just pray for her and uh, their family uh, at this time. Pray for strength, for wisdom, for the doctors as well. Father, we continue to uh, come before you casting our cares upon you, knowing that you are the one who is in control, and we are to rest in your provision and your strength and your power, doing what we're supposed to do in terms of studying your word and applying it, and putting everything else in your hands. Father, as we study your word this evening, we pray that God the Holy Spirit would help us to understand the things we study and that we may have a clearer understanding of the gospel that has been clearly taught from the time of Adam's uh, sin until the present and on into the future that always focuses on the complete work of the Messiah anticipated in the Old Testament and provided for in in the New Testament and paying for our sins by his death on the cross. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, just a little bit of review. The real issue in salvation is not what is normally presented in most gospel presentations. Not that that makes most gospel presentations that terribly wrong, but if you look at most gospel presentations, they usually start with a question somehow related to life. Would you like to have eternal life? Would you like to go to heaven when you die? Um, The issue really in salvation isn't so so much a matter of life, but that is definitely part of it because part of the major problem that we have is a lack of life, we're born spiritually dead, but the other part of the problem is that we're not righteous. It's how do we get righteousness? And of course, as I've pointed out before in our study of Romans, that's the focus of Paul in Romans is on how we get righteousness. Now, as I pointed out last time, just by way of a quick review, righteousness and justice are word groups that are built off of the same basic root, root words in both Hebrew in the Old Testament and uh, Greek in the New Testament. There are other words that also indicate especially justice, but righteousness, it relates to the standard of God's character, and justice, the application of God's standard to his creatures. And then it is God's love that it's the expression of that integrity to his creatures in providing a solution based on grace for the application, for the gift of righteousness to people. And that's really what Romans is all about. Sometimes I think that we ought to approach a a, a, a gospel situation, evangelism situation a little differently and ask somebody, say, well, would you like to be perfectly righteous? See what kind of response we'll get uh, from that kind of approach, because that's, uh, that's very different. But that is what, really what Romans is all about, is how we get this gift of righteousness and what it means, what the implications are for us to have this gift of, of righteousness that we receive in salvation. Romans 4, Paul is going to give two illustrations to help 
his readers understand how we get righteousness. This isn't something new. This whole idea of righteousness by faith alone and not from works, not from morality, not from the Mosaic law, that this isn't a new idea. That this, And he's going to go to two Old Testament individuals in order to illustrate that, that it is always on the basis of faith, not works, that we receive righteousness. The first illustration is the key one, and that is Abraham. And so he introduces the topic with a rhetorical question in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? According to the flesh. And when he uses the term flesh here, he's talking about him in terms of his humanity. What has he found in the physical realm? Has he found spiritual righteousness, an eternal righteousness, or has he just found a relative righteousness? And then he explains the question further in verse 2, giving the answer for if Abraham was justified by works. And this is where we have the verb uh, dikaio, which is formed on the root which in Greek is simply a decay, D-I-K-E, and that root then is modified by various uh, suffixes to indicate different aspects of either righteousness or, justific- or justification in terms of, of the verb. And justification is really the idea of being declared righteous. It's a judicial term. It's a the courtroom term. If you've been following the Michael Jackson trial related to his doctor or uh, some of the other trials, that's the idea, is what happens in the courtroom. And when a court case goes to the jury, and the jury is going to return a verdict, and there have been some relatively uh, infamous ones over the last decade or two, where people are convinced, uh, especially we think of the O.J. Simpson trial, uh, convinced of some, someone's guilt, but the jury finds them not guilty. And that is a judicial declaration. It doesn't have anything to do actually with whether or not the person who committed the crime is guilty. It has to do with whether or not there is the proper evidence so that they can determine judicially that that person is guilty. And that is a good way to understand what we have. We are guiltier than you ever thought O.J. Simpson was in terms of sin and in terms of violating God's standard of righteousness. But we're declared not just not guilty, we're declared righteous because we are judicially given that gift of righteousness. It's not given to us in the way that makes us righteous, It doesn't make us moral. It doesn't obliterate part of the sin nature. It doesn't limit the sin nature so you're not as capable of sin as you were before because you and I both know better than that, if we're being honest, is we're just... In fact, if you were saved like I was when you were young, your sin nature just didn't have enough uh, opportunity yet to demonstrate its true core uh, capacity for evil if you were five or six or seven years old. But by the time you got to be 14 or 15, uh, it was beginning to, uh, what's the Navy term, get its sea legs, right? (laughs) And really operate, and especially if you talk to your parents about the time you hit adolescence. So the sin nature and the fact that we are born spiritually dead means that we have this predisposition to unrighteousness. Now, that does not mean that everything that we do is is bad or sinful. It all, in a sense, is because it comes out of the sin, sin nature, and we don't have any other nature from which it can come. But what it means is that in terms of God's standard of perfection, no matter how good we are, relatively speaking, we're never good enough to reach His, his a, a standard of absolute perfection. Absolute perfection. And even Jesus, when talking to his disciples, recognizes that men do, mankind does good things. He says, uh, you then being evil, recognition of the fallen nature, you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. 
So human beings can do wonderfully good things. Unbelievers can do wonderfully good things. But they're not the kind of good, qualitative, intrinsic good, that is going to gain the righteousness of God, which is why Isaiah points out that the problem with our righteousness or any righteous deeds that we perform is that in comparison to God's standard, they're, they're filthy garments. They're, they're disgusting, and they never uh, allow us to reach the level, level of good. So how then do we get righteousness? So in Romans 4.3, Paul gives his example from Genesis 15. He says, for what does the Scripture say? And he points out just methodologically the issue is always go back to the Scripture. In fact, I was in an interesting situation yesterday afternoon. I was over at a um, Jewish friend's house yesterday afternoon. He's not a a believer. And um, was there with uh, another uh, Jewish lady, uh, businessman, uh, businesswoman rather, and uh, this one friend was talking to her about, oh, Robbie's a wonderful evangelical. His church loves Israel. They love the Jewish people. He was just going on like that. And uh, he said, um, he said, let me ask you a question just occurred to me. He said, if the Bible said, he said, now, at first he had me explain why we, why we support Israel. I said, because the Bible says so. That's why Christians, ultimately, Christians support Israel for a Christian reason. When you ask that question, you want to know, why do you, as a Christian, support Israel? As an American, I might have other reasons, but specifically as a Christian, I support Israel because the Bible says so. And he said, well, what if, what if the Bible said you were supposed to hate Israel? I said, then I would hate Israel, because the Bible's the ultimate authority. That wasn't the answer he expected. <laughs> But we always have to go back to what does the Bible say? And Paul is, is demonstrating that in Romans 4, 3, when he says, what does the Scripture say? The Scripture is the authority. So we have to go back and determine what the Scripture says. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 15 and get the context of this significant verse. The verse that he quotes is, states that Abram believed God, or in the Hebrew, it's believed in Yahweh, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. That's the New King James rendering. I'll put some other translations up there, up there in a little bit. Now, when we look at this chapter, I want to try to we, I want to contextualize this. And those of you who went through Genesis with me have heard some of this before. But every time I come to something like this, I like to. Uh, dig down a little more, do some additional reading, because this is a, 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 an incredibly important passage, and its interpretation is controversial even among those who hold to a free grace gospel. There are some who will take this to mean that uh, Abram, the belief that is talked about here in verse 6 is belief in the promise that God has just now made to Abraham, that his descendants would come through him and not through, uh, for example, an adoption of Eliezer. And then there are others who are also solid on the gospel, free grace advocates, all, dispensationalists all, who would say, no, this doesn't refer, verse 6 doesn't refer to what's happening right here. It is more parenthetical and is a reminder of something Abraham had already done uh, prior to this, and that he wasn't justified in Genesis 15, 6. I mean, at the events of 1 through 5, he was justified already. In fact, he was justified probably before Genesis chapter 12. And that's the view I take, but we need to look at these things and and uh, every now and then and get a little more uh, detail. So this chapter that we're looking at, chapter 15, can really be divided into two sections. Uh, The first section is verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 through 5, God is promising to Abraham a covenant, and that that covenant would bring blessing to him and his seed. That's the key idea, the key focus, as I pointed out so many times as we went through Genesis, that if you want to know, if you want to trace the main idea through Genesis, you trace that word seed all the way through Genesis, because from the very beginning of sin, God promised to Eve that um, that the seed of the woman uh, 
would crush the head of the serpent. So that's what all the genealogies in Genesis 5, Genesis uh, 10 and 11, all these genealogies are tr- all the way through Genesis and the rest of the Old Testament trace the seed. All the way down to you get to the genealogies in Matthew 1 and in Luke 3. And those two genealogies have really have two different purposes. A lot of people don't get it, always get that right. They think that uh, Matthew gives the genealogy of Joseph and they teach that that is the legal claim that Jesus had to the throne through his adoptive father, Joseph. And Luke 3 traces, it from, traces the genealogy, leaves it in a lot of gaps, traces it from, Gen, from Adam all the way to Jesus through Mary. And that's the physical line of descent. But that's wrong. The reason Matthew gives a genealogy is not to show that Jesus has a legal right to the throne of David through his adoptive father, Joseph, because Joseph was a descendant through Keniah. And Jeconiah was one of the last and most evil kings in the southern kingdom. And God uh, pronounced a judgment, a curse on him, saying that no descendant of his would sit on the throne of uh, Israel. So no descendant of Keniah, no physical son of Joseph or adoptive son of Joseph had a legal right to the throne of, of Israel. The genealogy of Matthew is to show that the seed doesn't go through Joseph at all. It can't, it, it, in other words, it is supporting the necessity of a virgin birth that would leave Joseph out of the line. So it's, uh, it's important to make that decision. So you trace the whole seed line down through Genesis, and this is all about the seed. Is the seed going to come physically through this man who has passed his ability to, to father children? Is it going to come literally through him and Sarah, who also is beyond her years to, uh, to have a child, become pregnant? Or is God going to give him, Abraham, a physical, uh, physical descendant? So this is the focal point of this, of this passage. And what ties the two sec- that, that's the first part, which is God's reiteration of the promise in verse, in verse 5 when he tells Abraham to look at the stars in the sky and uh, that his descendants would be more numerable than, those, than the stars in the sky. And then from verse 7 down through verse 21, we have the, lead, the promise, the, the covenant-cutting ceremony, the formal ceremony when God makes the covenant with Abraham. And from verse 7 down through the end of the chapter. Uh, and in, it's concluded in verse 18. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, uh, descendants, I've given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then he enumerates uh, a number of the different peoples, the different ethnic groups that inhabited uh, the land uh, of Canaan. So this, uh, this prelude to the chapter in these first five verses. There's a hinge verse in verse 6, which is the, our focal point. But the, the initial declaration uh, is designed to reiterate the promise that's already been made. So the promise of the, co- the covenant isn't cut formally. The contract's not signed, as it were, until we get into verses 7 uh, down through 17. But the promise of giving the covenant is made as far back as Genesis chapter 12. So that's one reason we know that, that the, the, this, this statement of Abram's faith in Yahweh must go back to events before an initial promise, uh, initial promise was given. So verse 6 then fits as a parenthetical statement that is a reminder of of the foundation for the promise. The foundation for the promise is Abram's belief in God and the fact that God had imputed to him righteousness. And because he was now righteous, God could give him this covenant. Now the covenant, as it is set forth in the Abrahamic covenant, as it's set forth uh, specifically in this chapter, but also in the numerous uh, repetitions, is a uh, is a distinct kind of covenant in the ancient world. There was an article that was published in the early part of the 60s entitled The Covenant of Grant in the Old Testament 
and in the ancient Near East by Moshe Weinfeld, or Weinfeld at uh, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, which was a groundbreaking study on the covenant of Moses as well as the Davidic covenant. And uh, it's important to understand that there were basically two different kinds of contract forms that were prominent in the ancient Near East. Now we call it the Middle East, but back whenever you study it in the ancient world, it's called the ancient Near East, that, that dominated. And so the, the covenants we have in the Bible were probably the prototype you know, who came first, the chicken or the egg? Who came first, God or man? God came first. And so God's covenants with man always preceded any human covenant. So all human covenants are somehow based on uh, the, the, what they understood as the structure of divine covenants. And then, of course, they would be developed and expanded on um, down through history. As, as time went by, man, mankind would modify, and different cultures would modify these cultures. And in the ancient Near East, you had two types of, co- of, of covenants. One is a covenant uh, where the king would promise, conditioned upon the behavior of his people, of his people or a client nation or a feudal, uh, a, a, a feudal uh, servant, would promise certain uh, benefits, that if you're obedient, if you guard my borders, if you are productive, then I will do these things, positive things for you. And if you're disobedient and you don't provide enough uh, tax revenue, you don't produce enough uh, agricultural products, whatever it might be, uh, you don't protect me from my enemies, then I will punish you in certain ways. And that <clears throat> had become a very formal type of contract by the middle of the 2nd century B.C., around 1500, 1400 B.C., and that was, became known as the suzerain-vassal treaty form. That's a technical, uh, technical name for it. That's really the pattern of the Mosaic Law. It was designed with a, with a somewhat conditional sort of nature to it. But to a, a servant uh, that, had been, that had been obedient, that had blessed the sovereign, There was another kind of treaty that was called a royal grant treaty where one who was already an obedient servant is given an additional grace blessing based on the fact that he had been obedient. Now, it wasn't because he'd been obedient. It wasn't that if I'm obedient, I'll get this. It was totally at the discretion of the king, and that's what we have in the the Abrahamic Covenant. At the introduction to his article, uh, Weinfeld writes, two types of covenants are found in the Old Testament. Uh, The first type that I talked about, he says, the obligatory type reflected in the covenant of God with Israel. That would be the suzerain vassal treaty. And he says the second kind he calls the promissory type reflected in the Abrahamic and Davidic uh, covenant. And then on the next page... He says, uh, while the treaty constitutes an obligation, talking about the the obligatory treaty, the suzerain vassal treaty, he says, while that treaty constitutes an obligation of the vassal to his master, the suzerain, the grant constitutes an obligation of the master to his servant. And the grant type of treaty, he says, the curse is directed towards the one who will violate the rights of the king's vassal. And that's exactly what we have at the very beginning in Genesis 12, 3. God says, I'm going to give you this land, leave Ur, go to this land I'm going to show you, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. See, the cursing in the Mosaic Law is directed to whom? To the Israelites, those who are the servant, because the, the vassal, rather, because they, are be, they would be disobedient. But in a grant covenant, the curse is directed to those who would violate the rights of the, uh, of the vassal, of the one who's receiving the grant. He goes on to say, in other words, the grant serves mainly to protect the rights of the servant, while the treaty comes to protect the rights of the master. What is more, while the grant, uh, the grant is a reward for loyalty and good deeds already performed, the treaty is an inducement for future Uh, future loyalty. So he says that the grant serves to protect the rights of the servant, and the grant serves as uh, a reward for loyalty and good deeds. It's given to one servant, uh, one who is already there. So that, again, indicates that 
uh, if this is true, that God is giving the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham, and he's already entered into a relationship with God. It's not something that God gives him the covenant and then later he would become justified. That would not fit the pattern uh, that we see in this, type of, in this type of covenant. So we see these two sections in chapter, uh, chapter 15, God's reiteration of the promise in the first five verses, a reminder of the basis for the promise, the real cause of the promise, so to speak, in verse 6, and then the covenant itself being uh, cut and the, cere- the formal ceremony in verses uh, 7 down through, uh, down through 17. So at the beginning, God promises that Abram will have an heir who is a f- direct physical descendant of Abraham and Sarah. And so God appears to him and says, After these things, that is after the events, of chapter uh, 14 and the rescue of Lot and the defeat of the uh, five kings, he says, after these things, the word of the Lord, I think it's important here that it is indicated again as Yahweh. God doesn't really define for the Jews the significance of that name, the uh, tetragrammaton Yahweh, until Moses. But that doesn't mean they didn't use the name. They just, as, as, as God told Moses, um, I have have not identified what he means is I have not, not identified the significance of my name. So they understood that. And this name, Yahweh, was always associated and is always associated with God's covenant, faithfulness. So after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Uh, you're exceedingly, and I lost part of that verse, I guess, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? So we see Abraham is not quite focused on the fact yet that God's going to be able to uh, give him a son through his own body. And so he shows a level of doubt there. Now, I want you to note here, just we'll come back and look at this in a minute, the progression of this narrative just grammatically. Starts off after these things. There's a clear break between the events preceding in chapter 14 and the beginning of this episode. This is uh, completely different. There's not a continuation of events. This is something that takes place sometime later. And then uh, God appears to Abram in a vision. Abram speaks to God. He says, but Abram speaks to God. Actually, in the Hebrew, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a but. It could be a then. It's what's called a, a the vav is the Hebrew conjunction and, and at the beginning of in narrative, Hebrew narrative is a little bit uh, repetitive and redundant and boring. And it just reads, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. It just starts let, that way. You have a, a, a vav uh, con, uh, um, consecutive there plus an imperfect uh, tense of the verb, and that just shows ongoing na- uh, narrative. So this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. So that's how this should be translated to get the flow that God spoke to Abram in a vis- vision, and then Abram said, uh, made this statement, and then verse 3, then Abram said, it starts off with the same kind of construction, then Abram said, uh, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. This was the custom of the time that if uh, a couple were childless and they had a faithful servant, that's that royal grant idea again. They would give something to that servant as a reward for their loyalty, for their faithfulness, uh, but one who had already entered into a relationship in that family. Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born of my house is my heir. And then verse 4, there's a break in the narrative, and behold, it does, it's not the normal uh, progression of the narrative with a, a vav consecutive. There's a break there. Hanani, behold, the word of the Lord came to him, Abram, saying, this one, that is Eliezer, shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And then you have again the same uh, grammatical construction, then he brought him outside, the he here being God. So you have <coughs> the word of the Lord came to him, <coughs> and then he brought him outside. 
and said, Look now toward heaven, count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then the next verse, verse 6, and the English says, And he believed in the Lord. Ah, but it's, that's not what it does in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, you don't, in, in, the, in the ongoing narrative, it is a vav plus an imperfect tense of the verb, but here you have a vav plus a perf- perfect tense of the verb, which means that the action is completely thrown off. It's not, it shows that verse 6 isn't a continuation of the story that the events of verse 6 follow verse 5. It shows that there's a break in the, in the writer's thinking, and he goes off on a tangent. And so the grammar here indicates that verse 6 is not the next logical step in the progression, but there's a break in the action. And so that would indicate, <clears throat> just on the grammar at that point, that what happens in verse 6 is taking us to some other uh, some other event. So let's just look at the grammar here a, a, a moment. This first verb is amin, <coughs> which is the hifil perfect of the verb to trust or to believe. Now, the, all the others were imperfects. So this is, it's, it's, I know this gets a little te- technical, and somebody's probably gone off to whatever it is they're going to do tomorrow, and that's okay, I understand. But it's important here because it makes us realize that God isn't giving this co- covenant, promising a covenant to Abraham, and then Abraham gets saved because he believes it. This, this gracious gift of this promise to Abraham is being given as to a member of the one who is already a member of the family, one who is already a believer. And we're being reminded of this, that he believed, or we to, to get it, or to paraphrase it into everyday English, now remember, Abram had already believed in the Lord, and it had already been imputed to him as righteousness. So what the the writer is doing here, what Moses is saying here, is remember what the foundation for this promise is. It's the grace of God in giving Abram righteousness on the basis of his faith. Now I put up here on the screen three different translations. The first is the New King James translation, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. We'll just pay attention to the first part of this now. Uh, <clears throat> the Tanakh, now the Tanakh is the uh, Jewish uh, Publication Society uh, translation of, I believe it was 1987, which is a little more modern. The third citation on the screen is the from the uh, Jewish Publication Society Tanakh from 1917. Tanakh is what the uh, Jews call the Old Testament. It's an anacronym for the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. And so they just take those initial consonants and make a word Tanakh. So they refer to the Tanakh as the um, as the uh, uh, Old Testament. And I just wanted you to notice the difference in how they translate this. Verse 6 they say, and because he put his trust in the Lord, he reckoned it to his merit. Now, the word there for merit is, as we'll see, is tzedek, and it really doesn't have to do with merit as much as it has to do with righteousness. So that throws throws it off target a little. And then the uh, the older version of the Tanakh. Uh, says, and he believed in the Lord, almost identical to the New King James, and he counted it to him for righteousness. A much better translation. I've run into this a few times, but the, the Jewish Old Testament, the Jewish Tanakhs aren't any different from English Bibles. I could put up five different English translations up there, and you would find these kinds of little uh, differences in the way the translators handled some things, because too many translators want to add their interpretation into a translation rather than just uh, simply translating. 
Now, John Salehammer, who wrote the commentary of Gen- uh, for um, on uh, on Genesis uh, in, the, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary series, makes the point here. I, I thought he made a good analogy here. He said, recognition of Abram's faith at this point in the story, however, should not be taken as the initiation of his faith. Abram had already responded earlier to the call and promise of God's word in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Just as the covenant ritual of chapter 15 does not initiate God's commitment, that is, God's promise to Abraham, but formally ratifies it, so the narration's affirmation of Abram's faith in verse 6 declares the faith Abram had exercised from the outset. So here, he and a number of other uh, commentators would take the same view that I take, and that is that this is it goes back to something uh, much earlier. When Abram, uh, in fact, in, in some of the uh, uh, legends of the Jews, they put Abram's belief in God back as far as the time when he was about 40 or 50 years of age, much, much earlier, long before God appeared to him and, and uh, called him to come forth from Ur of the Chaldees. And I believe that's true. Abram was saved, justified, much, much before. We're not told about that. We, when first time we see Abraham, he is a growing believer in God and God's promises for a Messiah in the Old, Te- as was uh, exemplified uh, in the Old Testament. So we're looking at this verb, "Amen." It's where we get our noun "Amen," which we utter at the end of a prayer, and it is uh, the one of two primary words for faith. In the Old Testament, this word, and then the other word, one you've uh, we've referred to many times before, and that's the word uh, uh, batach. And there's a slight differences in the emphasis that each one brings to the table. But we're just going to talk about uh, aman, or the noun amen tonight. So, the first, me- uh, first point on this is that the root meaning of the Hebrew concept of belief has to do with stability or certainty. Now think about that. I believe something means I am certain, I am uh, I'm assured, I am positive that this is true. It has this idea that this is certain. It's not like what you'll hear from a lot of, uh, a lot of liberal theologians and, and liberals in other areas who say, well, this, this is what we know for sure. Beyond that, well, that's in the realm of faith. You know, they always do that. I was, I, I was reading a book this morning on the... Uh, uh, it's a good book to wake up with, get your blood pressure going, uh, get you all stimulated early before you ever get out of bed and get your coffee going. You're wide awake because you're mad. Uh, it's a book on the uh, Israel-Palestinian conflict. And I was writing nasty comments in the margin from almost the first paragraph because you can tell from things they say that they just completely reject any any value in anything that the Bible says. It's just, oh, well, that's just something of faith. That has nothing to do with, that doesn't even give us any idea of what was going on at the time. You just can't trust it at all. It's a book of faith. And it's like you can know something or you can have faith, but they're opposites. But the Bible sees faith as an element of knowledge and certainty. And we've gone over this before, that, that the way we come to learn things is one of four different ways. I don't have the chart. I didn't put it in tonight, but uh, we've seen it enough. The first way is through the use of reason. Rationalism, technically, is what it's called. Plato in the, um, Plato in the ancient world and Descartes in the more modern world and the Enlightenment. And it is, it's that reason can lead us to truth. Reason alone can lead us to truth. Empiricism says, no, 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 reason can't really get you outside of your own head. That was the critique of Descartes. You have to go with sense knowledge, what you see, hear, feel, taste, touch. Empiricism. And empiricism, only sense data, only that which you see, hear, feel, taste, touch, can lead you to true knowledge. 
And then the third way is, is, and it always follows its flow in history, first you have rationalism, then that fails, and then empiricism, and that fails, and then, well, we can't get there on the basis of logic, so let's just leap there in mysticism. And so mysticism always follows the skepticism that comes from the failure of rationalism or empiricism. Now, what they all have in common is that they all have a belief in the ability of the human brain to properly decode and interpret data, whether it's intellectual data or whether it is external data. They're all grounded in faith. Rationalism is built on faith assumptions. Empiricism is based on faith assumptions. Mysticism is based on faith assumptions. It's not faith versus reason, faith versus empiricism. Empiricism, rationalism, and mysticism are all grounded on an an assumption, a belief that man can properly interpret the data without any outside input at all. And over against those three, we have revelation. And revelation is an authority God explaining or giving information you cannot get from rationalism, empiricism, or mysticism to man, and man again responds by believing the content of what God has revealed. And so faith is operative in every system of knowledge. It's not faith or knowledge. Faith is a component in any kind of uh, in any kind of knowledge. And so that's what is emphasized here in this word is the sense of certainty, the conviction of, uh, of, of, of certainty uh, in, in your knowledge. So the root meaning of the Hebrew concept is that of stability and certainty. And one of the places where we get evidence of this is in this verse. Now, uh, I didn't underline it but I have a bracket at the end, so you can probably guess it. But try to figure out where the word for faith is, where Amen is in this verse. At that time, Hezekiah, this is at the time of the Sennacherib invasion into, into uh, Judah, and, he, and uh, Hezekiah's got to pay the bribe to pay him off. And so Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord, and from the doorpost which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Where do you see faith in there? See, you probably don't. But the word that's translated doorpost really is the, su- the p- support of the pillars. It's the foundation, and it is a, a, a noun form of the verb amen. And the bedrock, some of you have been to Israel before, you go down, to, you go down the tunnels under the Temple Mount, and you go down un- un- under, the, uh, under the Temple Mount, and they show you the foundation stones that are put under the Temple Mount. And people go to Egypt and they ooh and they ah over the fact that they managed to uh, transport these uh, 15, 20-ton blocks of rock up to the pyramids to build the pyramids. Well, you go down under the Temple Mount, and, and they've got one foundation stone there that they measure, they, they estimate it weighs 140 tons. And the Jews had the engineering and the ability to bring that up to the Temple Mount. That, when you build something on a foundation stone that weighs 140 tons, you have stability. You have certainty. It's immovable, unshakable. That's the idea. That's why that word is, is used there. So faith has to do with this sense of certainty. And wouldn't you know it, we have something like that. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is a certainty of knowledge apart from either empiricism or rationalism, but it is based on the authority of God's Word telling us something. So we believe it to be true, and it is real to us, just as real as if we have witnessed it in the laboratory, just as if we had actually measured it, weighed it, uh, written down all of our observations on a physical object, just because we haven't seen it, tasted, touched it, just because we haven't, uh, we don't have the presuppositions to make up the um, uh, major assumptions or the uh, 
um, um, as a basis for the conclusion in a logical argument doesn't mean it's not just as true. It is just as true because God said it. So there used to be a little, uh, back in the 70s, there was a bumper sticker <clears throat> that I would see occasionally that would say, God said it, that uh, God settles it, I believe it, that settles it. What's wrong with that? It should read, God said it, that settles it. I believe it. It's not settled because I believe it. It's settled because God said it. So you always have to make sure that your the authority is the Word of God. God said it, therefore it's true. Whether I believe it or not is irrelevant. It's what God said. Now we have an, another example of faith in Ephesians chapter, I mean in Exodus chapter 4. Let's just turn over there for a minute. Hold your place in Genesis, and we'll just turn over a little bit to this event in Exodus 4 to get an example of how, of how faith is used. Exodus chapter chapter four. Well, before we get to this, let me make one other, a couple other points. Um, in the theological word book of the Old Testament, the writer makes the point that in the hifil stem, which is what we have here in, in Genesis fifteen, the word I mean basically means, or the verb I mean basically means, to cause something to be certain or sure, to be assured. And this is the sense that we have for the, the way the word is used. Uh, in terms of belief, it, we believe it because it is it's sure there 's a sense of certainty in our minds that a statement is is true now the other interesting thing about amen as opposed to batak is amen is a word, and aman the verb is a word that is used mostly in response to something said by someone else. God makes a promise, and we aman we believe it. So as opposed to passages where, where you're uh, uh, exhorted to trust in the Lord, that would be batach. But amen expresses a person's response to a statement or promise uh, by, a promise by God. So that faith or belief then means that someone is, has a sense of assurance or certainty that something is true. Now let's look at this example in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4 is in the middle of the conversation that God is having with, with, um, with Moses, giving him his commission to go to the Pharaoh to free the Israelites. And the chapter begins with God uh, telling Moses to go, and Moses says, well, what if they will not believe me or listen to my voice? See, it's the response to a voice that's, that, that comes out in that particular verse. And so God then gives him evidence. See, there's nothing wrong with basing faith on evidence. It's not, uh, it's not a faith that's just a leap of faith. Le- leap of faith terminology is existential. It's not biblical. We don't believe something with no evidence. God gives all kinds of evidence in the Scripture. Jesus uh, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 1, after the resurrection, talked to the disciples and gave them many convincing proofs of the resurrection. God doesn't say, park your brain in neutral, just you know, believe something. There is evidence. So uh, there's going to be signs, there's going to be miracles that uh, Moses is going to perform before uh, Pharaoh. And so he's going to go, and uh, later on Moses says, well, God, I've just, I just can't really talk very well. So God says, okay, I'll send uh, Aaron as your, as your spokesperson. And then at the end of the chapter, look at verse 28, pick up the context. So Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And here's our verse, verse 30. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then he did the signs in the sight of the people. What's the result? The people believed. Amen. They believed. They trusted in God. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. 
Ten chapters later, in Exodus 14, after the uh, parting of the Red Sea, we're told so the Lord, in Exodus 14.30, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the dead on the seashore. See, faith doesn't oper- necessarily operate apart from empirical data. We're not saying that empiricism is wrong or rationalism is wrong, but empiricism and rationalism that are built on the wrong starting point are wrong. God uses empirical data all the time to as confirmatory evidence to validate what he has done. Verse 31, Then Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And here's another interesting point. We see a often fear of the Lord and belief in the Lord used in parallel constructions in numerous passages. So that in those kind of passages, fear of the Lord goes beyond just simply uh, awe for God or respect for God, but it almost becomes a synonym for believing God because he is in authority. So Abram believed in the Lord. To believe something means to agree that something is true. It's intellectual. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about the distinction between head belief and heart belief, but we don't believe with our heart in terms of a physical organ. When you use those metaphors in Scripture of head or heart, it's not in the context of this head versus heart theology. Uh, one of them, she said, well, that's intellectual, but you have to believe with your emotions or something like that. But the Bible doesn't make those kinds of distinctions anywhere. How can you believe? Belief itself is an intellectual, it is a mental activity. When someone says, I agree, I affirm, I assent to the fact that X is true. Now, some people say, oh, well, that's a pretty superficial kind of faith that you just assent to the fact that something is true. Well, let me see. Something we all do that's rather disagreeable every year is to fill out our income tax returns. And when we finish sending them, and we have to sign them, when you sign that, you are saying that you agree that the numbers that are in your income tax return are true and accurate. So you agree that it's true, and you sign it, and you quit working on it. If you didn't agree it was true you would keep working on it. And that when we agree that something is true, that's all there is to it. We believe it. It's true. We stop working on it. So saying that it is intellectual assent is not a wimp out or a short-changed view of faith, which is what many Christians want, because they've got to add works to it somewhere, folks. They've got to bring it in the back door, bring it in the side door, bring it down through the attic. Somewhere they've got to introduce works into it. And faith is simply believe. And you don't believe with your finger, with your toe, with your elbow. You believe with your brain, with your mind, which is between your ears. You think through a concept and you say, is this true or not? And if you say, yes, this is true, Jesus died for my sins, that is faith. And when Abraham heard the promise of God, he had no idea how God would pull this off. But he knew God, and he knew God's character, and so he trusted and believed in the Lord. Literally, that's how it should be uh, translated. He believed in the Lord, and then it says, God accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, this is another interesting word here, because as you see on the screen, it's the word cheshav, and in this construction, as it's found in the text here, it's actually chashava. And um, it has this A-H suffix to it, which is actually that is a, a, a feminine suffix. And it means it. So it's a feminine it, which means it has to refer to a feminine noun. Well, the act of belief is... Um, our, 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 excuse me, righteousness, which is the next word we'll need, we need to look at here, is a feminine noun. Sedek is a feminine noun. So it doesn't say, and he, Abraham believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. It, it says, he accounted it, comma, 
righteousness to him. It's appositional. The righteousness defines the uh, pronoun it. And there are places here and there where you have that kind of construction. A couple of verses that talk about imputation are Second Samuel 19.20. And just, uh, he said unto the king, let not my Lord impute iniquity unto me. Psalm 32, 2, David says, happy is the man unto whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. We'll look at that verse. That verse is quoted in Romans 4, so we'll get back to that. But three verses, Exodus 2, 6, Leviticus 13, 57, and 1 Kings 19, 21 are among a number of verses that are cited in the grammars for the exact kind of grammatical construction that we have here in Genesis 15, 6, where you have a, a, a verb, he impu- in, in this case, he imputed, with a, a, a suffix on the end, which is a pronoun. So, for example, Exodus 2, 6, which is the closest, she saw him, the child. Saw, the verb, would have the, su- the, the pronoun suffix, added at the end of that verb, and then you have the noun explaining who the the pronoun uh, describes. She saw him, the child. Leviticus 13.57, thou shalt burn it, that which has in it the plague. Same kind of thing. The it refers to what has within it the plague. 1 Kings 19.21, he boiled them the flesh. So you have this uh, pronoun suffix, at the end of the verb, and then you have the noun. So the Exodus two six is the almost identical type of just a raw uh, syntactical construction. And so what we see here is that this verse should be translated, and he had already believed in Yahweh. The object of his faith is God as the one who's the guarantor of the promise. And he, that is the Lord, accounted or imputed it, comma, righteousness to him. So it's clear that the imputation of righteousness is a result of faith, not of works, not of the law. Abraham precedes Moses by over 400 years before there's any any covenant. It's based solely on faith. This is why Paul uses it. And next time I'm going to come back, and we'll look at a little more at the meaning of tzedek for righteousness. This is a really important word. Uh, it's, it's really important within Judaism uh, today because they've added this notion uh, of merit and morality to it. But it's foundational within uh, the Old Testament and then the New Testament translations within the Dikaya Os and Dikaya Sune uh, word group. This helps us understand that we're saved not because there's anything in us. We are given a gift of righteousness that, that, that covers us like a cloak. And it doesn't matter what's under the cloak in terms of our salvation. What matters is that God just looks at that cloak that's over us and on that basis, and that's Christ's righteousness, and on that basis, God says, I judicially declare you righteous. That's what justification by faith alone is. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things this evening, to look at Abram, to understand that it is faith in your promise. In the Old Testament, an anticipation of the giving, the provision of salvation In the New Testament, a recognition that that has been accomplished on the cross and has been fully paid for, and we simply trust, we relax, we believe completely in Jesus Christ. We have confidence that if we die tonight and we we stand before your throne and you ask, why should we get into heaven? The answer is because we have the righteousness of Christ. And that's the, that's the solution. Father, we thank you for what you have so clearly taught us in your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.